Hey there, it's Kathy. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to History of the 90s early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. The 1990s were the heyday of witches in popular culture. There was literally something for everyone. Kid-friendly witch movies, teen witch movies, witch rom-coms, and TV shows. It seemed like witches were everywhere. Turns out the witch phenomenon was nothing new. It's happened before, and it's happening again right now in the 21st century. Perfect example. Singer Lana Del Rey attempting to put a hex on U.S. President Donald Trump. Seriously, I'm not making that up. In fact, studies show that with every wave of feminism, there is a renewed interest in the witch. Something that you may have noticed in the past few years as women found their footing within the Me Too movement. So on this episode of History of the 90s, just in time for Halloween, we're looking back at some of your favorite witch movies and TV shows of the decade. I'm Kathy Kinzora. Grab your brooms and get settled in. Let's start off in 1990 with the release of The Witches. It's been described as one of the scariest children's movies of all time. My orders are that every child in England shall be rubbed out, destroyed. Every single child eliminated. (gasps) Do I make myself clear? The Witches, starring Angelica Houston as the Grand High Witch, is an adaptation of a Roald Dahl children's book by the same name. Dahl, of course, also wrote James and the Giant Peach, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and Matilda. And he's drawn both praise and criticism for his quirky and sometimes dark storytelling. The Witches, which was first published in 1983, focuses on a coven of witches who've devised a plan to turn all of the children of England into mice. They're disguised as regular women, but under their wigs and deceptive face masks lies hidden a hideous creature who hates nothing more than little boys and little girls. A young boy who himself has been turned into a mouse sets out to stop the witches with the help of his grandmother. Oh, and like every good children's tale, the boy's parents died in a car crash at the beginning of the story. The Witch's Book won several prestigious awards, but you might be surprised to learn it was also banned in some libraries in England. Not because it was too frightening for kids, but because of its negative portrayal of women. One critic suggested the children's book would encourage boys to grow up to become men who hate women. But fans of the book said Dahl was simply passing on long-standing folklore about witches. Dahl himself defended the witches by saying, quote, I do not wish to speak badly about women. Most women are lovely, but the fact remains that all witches are women. There is no such thing as a male witch. And the controversy over the book wasn't contained to England. It also appears on the American Library Association's list of the 100 most frequently challenged books of 1990 to 1999, coming in at number 22. The movie version was made by director Nicholas Rogue, who's best known for the sci-fi film The Man Who Fell to Earth, starring David Bowie. It was produced by Jim Henson Productions, with special effects from The Creature Shop, which was called in to help create the slightly off-kilter world where children become mice and seemingly normal-looking women can pull their faces off and become witches. In what ended up being Henson's last movie before he died from pneumonia in 1990, the Muppet Master created the adorable mouse characters Luke and Bruno. Bruno? I don't believe it. I can talk. Bruno? Who's that? Bruno, it's me, Luke. Uh, I'm down here. Where? I can't see you. Down here. You can talk too. This is weird. 
The remote-controlled puppets were definite scene-stealers as they skittered around the Hotel Excelsior, trying to put a stop to the evil witches. But Jim Henson and his team were not only responsible for these amazing special effects, they also helped to have the ending changed. In the book, here comes a spoiler, the main character, Luke, who was turned into a mouse, stays a mouse at the end of the story. But Henson and director Nicholas Rogue thought the ending was too dark. They wanted a happier conclusion. So they introduced a good witch character who uses her powers to transform Luke back to a boy. Henson was smart enough to realize that the new ending might be a problem for Dahl. So he suggested to Penguin Books that they film two endings and test it with audiences. Whichever one audiences preferred would be the ending they would go with. The publisher agreed. Between October 1988 and May 1989, in both London and Los Angeles, the alternative endings were tested, and the version where Luke transforms back to a boy won out. When Dahl saw the new ending, he wasn't pleased. His widow told The Telegraph in 2006 that Dahl felt the movie missed the whole point of the book. You see, he believed the boy was happier as a mouse. In a letter to Jim Henson, Dahl wrote, What, after all, is so marvelous about being a human? Mice are far happier. They have far less worries. The witches went on to earn a modest $10 million at the box office, but it's now considered a cult classic. And that's why it's no surprise that the movie has been updated and re-released for a new generation. The Witches, starring Anne Hathaway as the Grand High Witch, was released on HBO Plus just in time for Halloween 2020. Okay, next up is Disney's Hocus Pocus. Sisters, prepare thyselves. Tis a life force. The motion works. Take my hands. We will share her. Oh, Winnie, how generous of thee. <laughs> The classic Halloween movie was released in 1993, and in the years since, it's become required viewing every October. But the funny thing is, it didn't start off that way. Hocus Pocus debuted in fourth place at the box office, quickly dropped out of the top 10, and ultimately earned a disappointing $39.5 million. It probably didn't help that it was actually released in the summer versus Halloween, and it opened against Free Willy and Jurassic Park. And then there were the bad reviews. The New York Times called the movie about three witches an unholy mess, while the Associated Press said the only real curses in this film will be yours as you walk up the aisle to leave. Hocus Pocus began as a bedtime story that producer and co-writer David Krishner told his two young daughters in the 1980s. The story he told was about a 17th century boy named Thackeray Binks, who tries to save his sister from three evil witches. They turn him into a cat, but are eventually put to death by the townspeople of Salem, Massachusetts. 300 years later, the witches reappear on Halloween night after a virgin lights the black flame candle. By the way, Hocus Pocus was the first time the word virgin was ever used in a Disney movie. In 1984, Krishner, who had also come up with the concept for the 80s animated movie The American Tale, pitched his witch story to Disney executives. And his pitch was the stuff of legends. Krishner suspended witches' brooms from the ceiling of the meeting room, displayed pictures of black cats drawn by children in his neighborhood, and he cut a slit in the bottom of a 15-pound bag of candy corn arranging the orange pieces so they spilled out onto a table. He told execs that Halloween was becoming a more popular, profitable holiday, and that he had an idea for a movie that would allow families to celebrate it together by watching a group of kids from modern-day Salem triumph over a trio of youth-obsessed sister witches who want to steal their souls. Krishner says by the time he got to the parking lot, one of the executives ran after him and said, don't take it anywhere else. We want to do it. About a dozen different writers worked on the screenplay for the next six or seven years before Disney was finally happy with it. 
Then they hired the fabulous Kenny Ortega of Dirty Dancing fame to direct. And none other than Bette Midler was cast as the main witch, Winnie Sanderson. We must find the book, brew the potion, and suck the lives out of the children of Salem before sunrise. Otherwise, it's curtains. We evaporate. We cease to exist. Dost thou comprehend? The Divine Miss M was joined by Sarah Jessica Parker and Kathy Najimy, who were cast as the remaining Sanderson sisters. An adorable Thora Birch was cast as young Danny, and famously, Leonardo DiCaprio was offered the part of Danny's brother Max, but turned it down so he could film What's Eating Gilbert Grape. Despite all of this assembled talent and the years spent perfecting the screenplay, the movie at the time of release was more of a trick than a treat. But thanks to 90s nostalgia, the movie has made a miraculous comeback from the dead during the nearly three decades since it was released. First on DVD and TV, then on streaming, Hocus Pocus has enchanted old fans and lured in new ones. BuzzFeed is routinely flooded with Hocus Pocus tribute posts and quizzes, and it routinely trends on Twitter throughout October. Then this year, in 2020, it was re-released in theaters to fill the vacuum created by COVID-19. On its opening weekend, the PG-rated horror was the second most-watched film in North American box offices. According to data from Box Office Mojo, it grossed nearly $2 million across 2,500 theaters. And at the time this episode was recorded, Hocus Pocus had surpassed Empire Strikes Back to become 2020's top re-release. And there's some more good news for fans. A follow-up to Hocus Pocus was announced in 2019. All three stars have confirmed they are interested in being involved with Hocus Pocus 2, but so far there has been nothing official, and thanks to the pandemic, it could be a while before production on the film gets started. Okay, now on to teen witch movies. And there's one film that stands out above the rest. You shut your mouth. The Craft features a group of outcast teenage girls who start practicing magic to get back at some of their tormentors. It was a hit at the box office when it was released in 1996, and to this day, it remains a defining movie about female empowerment and survival in the modern world. In the movie, Sarah, played by Robin Tunney, is struggling to fit in at her new high school and is essentially gaslighted by a boy she refused to have sex with on a date. Sarah hooks up with three other girls, Nancy, Bonnie, and Rochelle, played by Feruza Balk, Nev Campbell, and Rachel True. Those girls are social outcasts because they're considered to be a little bit weird, but they're okay with that. Girls, watch out for those weirdos. (laughs) We are the weirdos, mister. We Are the Weirdos became a rally cry for any teenage girl, or boy for that matter, who wasn't part of the cool crowd. This wasn't another high school movie that focused on the popular kids, and that's what made it so appealing. This was a film about four awkward outcasts who were trying to reclaim some power in their lives. Something that's so often denied teenage girls. And witchcraft was the way they were going to regain control and incite a little revenge along the way. I drink up my sisters. And I ask for the ability to not hate those who hate me, especially racist pieces of bleach blonde shit like Laura Lizzie. (laughs) Right up. This idea of women using witchcraft as a way to regain control is not new. That's why during turbulent times, we tend to see increasing interest in witch imagery and covens in popular culture and the real world. When second-wave feminism took hold in the 60s, a group of women founded an activist organization called WITCH, an acronym for Women's International Terrorist Conspiracy from Hell. They had small covens all over the country who placed hexes on male-dominated organizations. 
According to an article in the New York Times, which staged a Halloween hex on Wall Street in 1968. Dressed in all black with long peaked hats, the women sneaked through the narrow streets of downtown Manhattan late into the night, making their way to the entrance to the New York Stock Exchange, where they oozed glue into the latches of its doors. The next morning, the male bankers couldn't get in, and the Dow reportedly fell 13 points. In popular culture in the 60s, we had this. Elizabeth Montgomery in... Bewitched. The hugely popular TV series Bewitched followed the life of a beautiful and kind witch who could make magic with a wiggle of her nose. Then, during the 90s, we had third-wave feminism which some believe was prompted by Anita Hill's sexual harassment allegations against Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas. Suddenly, witchcraft was on the rise again, with stories like The Craft centering on empowered women using magic to take control of their own narrative. Okay, so back to The Craft. And let's talk about the four characters for a minute. First of all, the way they dressed. The craft introduced an entirely unique school uniform aesthetic. It included fishnet shirts, PVC black coats, and gothic chokers. Every alt girl wanted to dress like the craft coven, and the movie remains a source of inspiration for fashionistas to this day. Co-writer and director Andrew Fleming told HuffPost that he wanted the four main actresses to have a very gothic style. He said, quote, That was my premise. What if those witchcraft girls in high school dressed like they were in The Cure? I just had this idea that they should have a punk element. Fleming's writing partner, Peter Filardi, said when developing the characters, he modeled them after girls he knew in high school. Plus, each one was inspired and empowered by goddess archetypes and earth elements. Sarah is earth. Bonnie, with the power of foresight, is wind. Rochelle the Diver is water. Nancy, of course, is fire. And I should mention that Rochelle as a black witch was one of very few black witches who have appeared in pop culture. In a recent interview with Uproxx, Rachel True, who played Rochelle, noted just how unique the film was for its time and how unique it was for her to get to play the character who faces racism by teens in the movie. While making the movie, Andrew Fleming wanted to make sure that the Wiccan rituals they depicted were as authentic as possible. So he hired a Wiccan high priestess to act as a consultant. She made sure that the spells and incantations used by the girls in the film were basic enough to be understood, but were still legit. The result was a movie that inspired a generation of young women to try witchcraft and magic. The movie also inspired girls at countless sleepovers to try this spooky party trick. Come on, you guys. Come on, ready? <laughs> Light as a feather, stiff as a board. 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 In this scene, the girls gather around Rochelle, who's lying on the floor. They put their fingers underneath her and chant, Light as a feather, stiff as a board until she begins to levitate a couple of feet off the ground. This sleepover party trick has actually been around since long before the craft made it famous. One of the oldest accounts of light as a feather, stiff as a board, can be found in a 17th century diary of a British naval administrator and member of parliament. Samuel Pepys wrote about a friend who witnessed four little girls playing the levitation game in Bordeaux. According to the diary, the girls kneeled around a young boy and chanted, Still as a stone, cold as a marble, light as a spirit, we lift you in the name of Jesus Christ. While they chanted, the girls allegedly raised the boy into the air using only their fingers, just like the coven of teenage witches in the craft. Because of the success of the craft, Hollywood went full on witch mode with projects on both big and small screens. Before we get to the TV shows, let me finish up with one last movie. Practical Magic, starring Sandra Bullock and Nicole Kidman, was released in October 1998. 
it was adapted from Alice Hoffman's 1995 book of the same name. Practical Magic has been described as a witchy rom-com about two witch sisters, Jillian and Sally, who are orphaned and go to live with their witch aunts. The girls learn that they come from a long line of witches who've been cursed with a terrible fate. Jillian, Sally. You know the only curse in this family? She's sitting right down there at the end of the table. Your Aunt Fanny. <laughs> oh, come on, Jenny. Even you have to admit that any man who gets involved with an Owens woman is bound to end up six feet under. Spare me. The girls grow up in a gorgeous Victorian house on a small island in Massachusetts where they are routinely ostracized by the town locals. The story is as much about witchcraft as it is about sisterhood. When a grown-up Jillian is in an abusive relationship, Sally rushes to save her. Sally accidentally kills the boyfriend, and the girls use magic to bring him back to life. Then there's an exorcism. Things get really crazy. To make sure the witch details were correct, director Griffin Dunn, who is the son of Dominic Dunn and the nephew of the great Joan Didion, also hired a witch consultant to work with him on the film, just like the director of The Craft. But things didn't go so well for Dunn. He says the consultant demanded an extra $250,000 and a percentage of the film, or she would put a curse on Dunn and the movie. When he refused, the woman filed a lawsuit against Warner Brothers. They eventually settled for an undisclosed amount of money. But Dunn believes the curse may have been put on the movie anyway. It earned $68 million at the box office, which wasn't enough to cover the $75 million it cost to make it. And reviews were terrible. Roger Ebert called it too scary for children and too childish for adults, while another reviewer called it a chick movie with multiple personality disorder. There was one thing that everyone could agree that they liked, and that's the big white Victorian house where Jilly and Sally lived with their aunts. It was a scene stealer. With its wraparound porch and gable roof, the enchanting three-story home was so popular that living legend Barbara Streisand placed a few calls to see if she could buy it. Turns out, though, what you see in Practical Magic isn't real. It was just a shell constructed for the film and then torn down immediately after. Thanks to magic or maybe just nostalgia, Practical Magic has recently been given a second life as yet another witchy cult favorite. I mean, it makes sense in a way. All things witchcraft have seen a huge surge in popularity in the past few years. Social media influencers are using the hashtag witches of Instagram to share horoscopes, spells, and witchy memes. And Lana Del Rey wasn't the only one to call for a hex. Anti-Trump resistance activists carry signs that say, hex the patriarchy. Reading tarot cards and attending new moon ceremonies has become almost commonplace. And that's why the Owen sisters are a perfect fit for 2020. Okay, so in addition to witch movies in the 90s, we also had some very successful witch TV shows, including this one. The hugely popular TV series Sabrina the Teenage Witch actually started off as a made-for-TV movie, first airing on Showtime in April 1996. That's about five months before the TV series debuted on ABC as part of their TGIF lineup. The movie and the TV series are both based on a character from the Archie comic book series, and they both starred Melissa Joan Hart as Sabrina. But lots of other things were different. First of all, Sabrina's last name in the movie was Sawyer, and not Spellman. Plus, in the movie, Sabrina lived in Riverdale, Archie's hometown, now made famous by the popular TV series of the same name. In the TV series, Sabrina lives in a fictional Massachusetts town called Westbridge. Another big shocker for some fans, Ryan Reynolds played heartthrob Seth in the movie. And in one of the most interesting differences between the film and the TV series, Salem the Cat was voiced by a different actor in the movie who gave him a British accent. Nick Mackay, who famously voiced Salem for TV, did not have an accent. 
Can you wait till I finish my milk? <laughs> Did the cat just talk? Yes. And get this stupid hat off my head. Oh my god! As I mentioned, the Sabrina TV series debuted in September 1997 on ABC, where it aired for four seasons before moving over to the WB for another three seasons. The show was an immediate hit, with smart writing, cross-generational appeal, funny sight gags, and strong co-stars. But the main appeal was definitely the 20-year-old star Melissa Joan Hart, who had previously charmed audiences on Nickelodeon's Clarissa Explains It All. She was cute and incredibly likable as a teenage half-witch who lived with two magically gifted aunts, Hilda and Zelda, and Salem the cat, who in fact was a witch trapped in a feline body as punishment for his misdeeds. Hart was obviously qualified for the role, but she kind of landed the job thanks to her mom. After Clarissa Explains It All was cancelled, Melissa Joan Hart's mom, Paula Hart, received a copy of the Sabrina Teenage Witch comic book and came up with an idea. She wanted to develop the comic into a film role for her daughter and then in turn use the film as a vehicle to pitch a TV series. Once the movie was made, Hart pitched her idea for the Sabrina TV show to four networks in one day. By the end of the day, they had three offers. They went with ABC because the Hearts were a fan of the TGIF lineup and felt it was the right place for the show. ABC brought on comedy writer Nell Scavell to adapt the movie into a joke-filled sitcom. Scavell, who has written for many classic comedies, including The Simpsons and Murphy Brown, as well as David Letterman, wanted to make something that she would have watched as a teenage girl. She recently told The Guardian that's why Sabrina never hung out at the mall or went shopping. She cared about being a good friend, making good choices, and doing well in school. Scavell went on to say the magic was a metaphor for a young girl learning to control her desires and emotions, as well as an excuse to showcase a six-foot flan. It's beautiful! I've never seen anything like it. It's flan, and there's enough for everyone. But Sabrina was more than a fun show about talking cats and giant flans. It was also a show about female empowerment. Sabrina represented the peak of 1990s girl power, something we covered in episode 6 of History of the 90s. Girl power became the rally cry of the Spice Girls in the 90s, but it also led to a string of ultra-capable female characters who drew on supernatural elements to underline their unstoppable potential. Think Charmed, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, or Xena Warrior Princess. And according to a study out of England's University of Warwick, Sabrina and Charmed created a direct association between witchcraft and the notion of girl power. Sabrina was on the air for seven seasons, practically raising a generation of millennials who now in their 30s long for a wise-talking cat and the ability to cook dinner or change outfits with the flick of the hand. In 2018, the 90s favorite was resurrected on Netflix, but the reboot took the beloved source material in a totally new direction. The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina was originally developed at the CW as a companion series to Riverdale before it was moved over to Netflix. It's dark and gory and embraces traditional witch culture and lore with blood packs and exorcisms. And there is no talking cat. In July of this year, it was announced that the show would be cancelled after its fourth season, which is expected to run sometime before the end of 2020. There is another important witch character from 90s TV that I have to mention. Uh, hi. Willow, right? Why? I, I mean, hi. Uh, did you want me to move? Why don't we start with, hi, I'm Buffy, and uh, then let's segue directly into me asking you for a favor. Willow Rosenberg on Buffy the Vampire Slayer was not only Buffy's best friend, she eventually emerged as a powerful witch. Willow, played by Allison Hannigan, started to dabble with magic as early as the first season. But with every new season, her powers grew stronger and stronger. Willow, who started off as a bullied nerd in season one, grew in other ways as well. She eventually became more confident in her own skin, and in season four, came out as a lesbian, which broke the mold for how love is shown on network TV. 
And it wasn't just Willow. From the start, Buffy the Vampire Slayer was breaking molds and scoring points with both critics and audiences. It became an instant classic when it debuted in 1997 on the WB. And soon, executives were anxious to come up with a companion piece. The head of the network at the time was Suzanne Daniels, and after seeing the success of the craft, she decided they needed something about witches. She turned to TV writer and producer Constance Burge, who said in a recent interview with In Touch Weekly that she knew nothing about witches at the time. So she did a bunch of research and then went back to the network and pitched the idea of three sisters who had come from a long line of Wiccan women. When Charm premiered on the WB in October 1998, it broke records as the network's highest rated debut. It followed a trio of sisters who discover they are witches with magical powers. But not just any witches. Phoebe, Piper, and Prue, played by Alyssa Milano, Holly Marie Combs, and Shannon Doherty, are the charmed ones, the most powerful trio of good witches whose job it is to protect the innocent from darker forces. Creator Constance Burge has said that the sisters' magical gifts came from their real-life weaknesses as characters. Prue is very smart, so Burge says it seemed to make sense she would have powers that would be mind-related, hence the power of telekinesis. The middle sister always has trouble with time because she's people-pleasing, so freezing time felt like a good power for her. And then because the younger sibling was viewed as having no vision of the future, Burge says she thought it would be nice to give her the power of premonition. The real magician behind the show, of course, was Aaron Spelling, who made Doherty a household name on Beverly Hills 90210 and installed Milano on Melrose Place. And even though Doherty was notoriously difficult to work with on 90210, Spelling still cast her in his latest creation. Initially, it seemed all was good on set. In fact, Milano told CNN in 1998 that everyone got along great. She said at first she was intimidated because Doherty and Combs had an established friendship, but as soon as she got to that set, she was like, this is going to be so much fun. Well, turns out the fun didn't last. Doherty left the show at the end of season three, allegedly because of tensions between her and Milano. The story goes that Doherty, who served as a bridesmaid at Milano's wedding in 1999, stopped talking to Milano for some reason. This caused Milano to demand that Doherty be fired from Charmed. The firing never happened, though, because the savvy Doherty beat producers to the punch. She had learned of Milano's ultimatum and quit Charmed on her own accord. She was killed off by the Demon Sacks at the end of Season 3, replaced by Rose McGowan, who was introduced in Season 4. Look, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to drop this on you. I am your long-lost sister, Paige. I know... It sounds crazy, but it's true. We're all sisters in the real world. The show ran for eight years in total, and during that time had a ton of amazing special guests, including Jenny McCarthy, Nick Lachey, Billy Zane, and Amy Adams. During that time, Charmed cemented itself as one of the most popular shows on television. Viewers were drawn to its strong female protagonists and captivating story arcs, even if it could be a bit cheesy at times. When it ended, it was the second longest running drama to air on the WB network, as well as one of the longest TV shows in history to be spearheaded by women actors. A new rebooted charm with a whole new cast launched in 2018 on the WB. Season three has been confirmed for 2021. Recently, some of the original Charmed cast members got caught up in an online war of words about the new version. In a video posted to Twitter this month, October 2020, Rose McGowan and Holly Marie Combs had this to say about the new Charmed. But it sucks. I haven't seen it. I can't say that. I've never seen it. I didn't hear what you said. I said it sucks. (laughs) But I'm happy that people have jobs. Reboot star Sarah Jeffrey responded to McGowan's comments by tweeting, I find it sad and quite frankly pathetic to see grown women behaving this way. I truly hope they find happiness elsewhere and not in the form of putting down other women of color. Both Combs and McGowan fired back with some more jabs, then Shannon Doherty weighed in in favor of the reboot. And the last comment came just days before recording this episode. 
Combs tweeted, My charmed friends, I would like everyone to stop. She said, Truth be told, our issues were and are at the corporate level, and we have the receipts. Sounds like she might be getting ready to put a hex on someone. Well, we are out of time, and I am so sorry that I couldn't get to every witch movie from the 90s. In addition to the ones I mentioned, there's, of course, Halloween Town, Mary-Kate and Ashley's Double Double Toil and Trouble, A Simple Wish, Eve's Bayou, and the 1996 adaptation of The Crucible, starring Winona Ryder. Check out the show notes for a complete list of 90s witch movies that should keep you busy through Halloween. Thanks for listening to this episode of History of the 90s. And thanks to listener Sarah, who contacted me through Twitter to suggest an episode on 90s witch movies and TV shows. If you've got an idea for a show, I'd love to hear from you. Please drop me a line at 90s at CuriousCast.ca. That's 90s at CuriousCast.ca. You can also reach me through Twitter at 1990s History and on Instagram and Facebook. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to our show so you never miss an episode. And while you're there, check out some of our older episodes, like the one I mentioned earlier on Girl Power. You might also like the episode we did on the movie Scream last Halloween. We're available for free at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and everywhere else you get your streaming audio. You can also listen at CuriousCast.ca. This show is hosted and written by me, Kathy Kinzora. Dila Velasquez is our producer. Sound design and final production is by Rob Johnston. See you next time for more History of the 90s.